I would first wish to express my deepest gratitude to the Shri Guruji Centenary Celebration Committee for inviting me to participate in today's seminar on national security. I consider it a huge privilege to be in your midst today. Shri Sridharanji, Shri Murliji, and distinguished members of the audience. I have been asked to speak upon intellectual terrorism. I will modify it slightly and speak on intellectual subversion, of which intellectual terrorism is one important dimension. When we say intellectual subversion, who are we holding guilty of intellectual subversion in this country? I, for one, hold academia, the media, and the intellectual elite, those that have been educated in the English medium schools and institutions of higher learning. These are the three broad categories of people who I hold guilty of intellectual subversion in this country. What have they been subverting? They have been subverting the very idea of nation that the Hindu community holds. When I say Hindu, let me make a few things clear here. I'm going to be extremely blunt in my exposition. I do not speak to please anybody, neither do I speak to offend anybody. I speak what I perceive to be the truth. And when I say Hindu, I use it as the widely accepted term for those who practice Sanatana Dharma. Sanatana Dharma, I say, is Hinduism. People who practice Sanatana Dharma are Hindus. It is a part of the intellectual subversion exercise that they have discredited the word Hindu so that we are a nameless group of people, I, to which I will come to a little later in my talk. So when I say Hinduism and when I say Hindus, I mean Sanatana Dharma and the Dharmis. So what have these intellectual terrorists perpetrated? They have subverted the idea of nation. What is a nation? Nation, according to our classical texts, to Hindu, Indian classical text, is Rashtra. Rashtra is both territory and the people. There is a historical sense of belonging of the people to that territory. It is a territory with well-defined borders. Rashtra has well-defined borders and Rashtra means the people with a historical and an ancient sense of belonging to that territory. Indian classical texts speak of Hindu Rashtra as being one of the seven components of Rajya. Hindus constitute 85% of the population of this country. We are a nation of Hindus, but we are neither a Hindu Rashtra nor are we a Hindu Rajya. And this is the success of the intellectual subversion. That we have neither a Hindu Rashtra nor do we have a Hindu Rajya. What are the seven components of a Rajya that our classical texts speak of? They speak of the Swami, Amatya, Durga, Kosha, Danda, Bala, and uh, one more. Uh, let me come to it. Danda and Bala. There are seven components. Swami or the king would be the state, the head of the government, the Amatya or the minister will be the council of ministers, 
Durga is the capital. Kosha is the territory. You have Danda and you have Bala. Of all this, it's very important that you have the Hindu ethos truly reflected in at least some of these components. It is the success of intellectual subversion in this country that a person who attempts to be the Swami is a Roman Catholic European who has neither a historical sense of belonging to this territory nor an understanding of what this Rashtra is all about. It is to the success of intellectual subversion in this country that you have a council of ministers who actively propagate and perpetuate the politics of minoritism in various spheres of national public life. If Danda can be construed in modern terms to be the law and the judiciary, you have a constitution and you have a judiciary which is actively hostile to the Hindu community. Let me take this step by step. When I say nation, I have an understanding of who belongs and who does not belong. It is to the success of this intellectual subversion that Hindus constantly speak of Vasudeva Kutumbakam and think Sonia Gandhi and Mother Teresa are a part of this Kutumbakam inside this country. When we have a distinct sense of us and them, we must have a sense of who is a Hindu. The them is who is a non-Hindu. If we have a sense of us and them, there is a sense of Indian Hindus. There is a sense of non-Indian people who profess the Hindu religion. Kautilya's Arthashastra did not deny the Vasudeva Kutumbakam principle at all. But Kautilya knew who was a national, who was a non-national. Kautilya encouraged the Hindu way of welcoming refugees. But Kautilya also said, keep the refugees out of your national borders. Provide for them. Take care of them. See to it that they are comfortable and feel secure. But do not bring them into national borders until their loyalties have been tested and found to be true. Vasudeva Kutumbakam does not mean opening up all your doors and allowing everybody to come inside, particularly when you are in a state of weakness. Let us take academia first. What are the falsehoods that they have propagated to subvert the very idea of a nation? They have, I think, done two things. They have fragmented the Hindu consciousness so that a very large section, or shall I say a very significant section of the Hindu community has been placed outside of national borders and other sections of the Hindu community have been placed outside the Hindu community itself by propagating the theory of the Aryan invasion. Indian academia dominated by the Marxists 
have successfully placed a significant section of the Hindu community outside national borders. And this is not something peculiar to India. This Aryan invasion theory was a colonial construct. It is a white Christian construct. And they have played this game in North America where they have had this, this ridiculous Bering Strait theory which said that the Native Americans whom they almost exterminated through genocide and Christian colonialism were themselves migrants from elsewhere. That is to say, they propagated the Aryan invasion theory here because the intellectuals among the Hindu elite who were in the forefront of resisting colonial invasion, the colonial administrators turned the argument back at them saying, you yourselves have come from outside, we have come a little more recently. To justify the genocide of the Native Americans, the white colonial research which came out of Harvard and Smithsonian placed the Native American population outside of the North American con continent and they said you people came here several centuries ago maybe but you are as much migrants as we are there is no such thing as a Native American population you are a migrant we are a latter day migrant. Udir Nambudriji in the previous session said how could EMS Nambudri Pad have gone running to the Soviet ambassador when his homeland or motherland or the Matru Bhumi was being attacked? You must understand, Islam, Christianity and communism which was a virulent reaction to Christian capitalism, none of the three ideologies or philosophies subscribe to the concept of homeland, motherland or Matru Bhumi. These are aggressive conquering ideologies. They believe all territories are open for conquest. It is only the Hindus and Jews who are born into their faiths on a territory which they call their own, who have the concept of Matru Bhumi, who have a concept of homeland. The other three ideologies or philosophies do not subscribe to home. So by placing a significant section of the Hindu community outside national borders and by declaring that Dalits and tribals are not part of the Hindu community, the academia, Indian Marxist academia has fragmented the Hindu consciousness. This was success number one. They have propagated the untruth that the Indian civilization has always been pluralist. This concept of pluralism, please understand, is a Western colonial Christian concept. Christianity also spread by the sword. Today, the developed Western nations may have succeeded in branding Islam a terrorist religion and the Western Christian, white Christian nations as the defenders against terrorism. But let's not forget, Christianity also spread by the sword. It was also intolerant. With the advent of democracy, which is also a Christian construct, when political Christianity had to accommodate people of other ways of life, and when Christianity devised other weapons of conquest, like evangelization, they made pluralism a virtue in their nation states. Hindu dharma has always believed or has always subscribed to diversity. We don't need this Christian colonial concept of pluralism inside India. We have always been diverse. Pluralism, please understand, is multiculturalism, which is the new term for pluralism in Western democracies. This pluralism or multiculturalism is accommodating 
the indigestible elements of your society who refuse to become a part of the mainstream. Those elements which do not consider this territory to be their matrubhumi, those elements which do not subscribe to Sanatana Dharma or Hinduism, those that insist that they will live as indigestible elements, but they seek accommodation within the broader, diverse parameters of Hindu Dharma, these are the pluralist elements. And when white, Christian, colonial, Western democracies promote the concept of pluralism, this is for the non-white, non-Christian democracies like India, whereas they are rejecting multiculturalism in their own countries. The Australian Prime Minister is saying, subscribe to the Australian culture. The British Prime Minister is saying, subscribe to the British culture. Australian culture, American culture, British culture, please understand, is white Christian culture, whether Catholic or Protestant. And immigrants and migrants who seek citizenship or residency in their countries are demanded, it is demanded of them that they have proficiency in the English language and that they subscribe to the broad cultural values which are rooted in white Christianity. And this pluralism, they want India to accept as an integral part of Indian polity and this subversion. It is this intellectual subversion which has launched Sonia Gandhi into the forefront of Indian polity. I personally consider the presence of Sonia Gandhi in Indian polity as much as an affront to my sensibilities as the mosque in Ayodhya, Kashi and Mathura. It is an affront to my sensibilities, to my Hindu sensibilities. This is success number two. The third idea that they are propagating is the concept of South Asia. This concept of South Asia, which has no legitimacy, is a political construct with its origins in American think tanks, where they seek to subsume. Please understand one thing. If there is one thing that both Islam and Christianity are afraid of, it is Hindu nationalism. Hindu nationalism poses the biggest conceptual threat to both Islam and the evangelical church. The third idea that they are propagating is the concept of South Asia, where they hope that India's territorial borders and her Hindu identity will be subsumed in the larger Muslim-dominated region of Pakistan and Bangladesh. When they say South Asia, I don't they think they have Bhutan and Sri Lanka in mind. When they say South Asia, they primarily mean India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. <clears throat> the most subversive act, act undertaken by Indian academia is the kind of history that they have written for us. It is a defeatist history. It is a history which says that the Indian nation was invaded upon hordes and hordes of people and that they emasculated Indian society, that Hindu society was weakened because of them, putting us in a defeatist frame of mind. But is this true? This is not true. I have one of the most brilliant papers compiled by Dr. M. D. Srinivas of the Center for Policy Studies in Chennai. And look at what he's saying. It was the Hindu community. Islam had already overridden Europe, Africa, and large parts of Asia. But Hindu community kept off the Islamic invaders who could not get hold of foothold even in India between 600 and 1200 AD. Islam could not get a foothold here. And which were the Samrajas and Rajas which had held them off? The Chalukyas, the Rashtrakutas, the Karkotas of Kashmir, the Rajputs, they kept Islam away from getting even a foothold in India up till the 12th century. Once Islam got its foothold here, there were still large parts of India which were never under their control. Large parts of South India 
Assam, Orissa, they were never under the Muslim rule for any great significant period of time. The Madurai Sultanate was thrown out within 30 years. You had the Marathas, you had the Vijayanagar Kingdom, the Samrajas, you had the Bundelas, you had the Sikhs, you had the Jats who raised powerful military organizations to combat Islam. And the Islam that came to India was Jihadi Islam. Jihadi Islam is not a phenomenon of the 20th or the 21st century. When Islam came to India, it came as Jihadi Islam. It was only Jihad that the Hindu community has faced from 600 AD. We never allowed them to set, set up any kind of government till 1200. But even after we lost militarily to Islam, Islam was a world conquering force, let's not forget. And when we lost militarily, see what we threw up. Sanatana Dharma in the form of Acharyas, Bhakti movement, Shastras, the commentaries, the Bhashyas, the abundance of Sanatana Dharma religious literature which came through after we lost militarily. Sanatana Dharma has been the core of Hindu Rajya. It was the core of Hindu Rajya in Southeast Asia for close to 1000 years between 300 AD and 1500 AD. The Rajas and Samrajas of Southeast Asia had Sanatana Dharma as their core. And Sanatana Dharma influenced West Asia, Central Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia. And we have an external affairs ministry today which has made sure that India is surrounded in every state adjoining her by ideologies and religions actively hostile and inimical to Sanatana Dharma and the Dharmi here. Nepal has fallen victim. Bhutan is well on its way to falling victim. Bangladesh, Pakistan, we have lost Sri Lanka also. India failed to step into Sri Lanka. Musharraf has stepped into Sri Lanka. India failed to step into Nepal, China, America and the Maoists have overrun Nepal. Hindu Rajya means territory under my control and territory under my influence. It is the subversion of intellectual India that we believe in the Gujral doctrine which says given, surrender, overrun, welcome, and decapitators. What is destroying India today is intellectual subversion in polity, which gives them the ideology upon which the UPA government and even the NDA government to a certain extent functioned. How else can you explain the fact that the NDA government handed over Rajka to Nirmala Deshpande? It was our government which did that. How else can you explain the fact that it was the NDA which made M.K. Narayanan a member of the National Security Advisory Board? It is intellectual subversion. We are so afraid of people calling us intolerant. When are we going to say, yes, there is a us and there is a them. There are those who belong, there are those who do not belong. But you are welcome. You will be provided with all comforts, respect, the freedom to practice your religion. But you cannot be a part of the Hindu Rashtra. You cannot participate in power. Do we have the courage? We had the courage and that is why we remained a Hindu Rashtra and a Hindu Rajya. The day we opened all doors indiscriminately and the day we used Vasudeva Kutumbakam as our defining characteristic without the strength but from weakness, we have allowed intellectual subversion to weaken us to such an extent that 50 years after independence, the power returned to Hindus. But what kind of Hindus? Hindus who were ashamed to be Hindus, regressive Hindus, deracinated Hindus, Hindus who had no faith in their own civilization. It is who Hindus who speak badly of the caste system. 
It is Hindus who speak badly about our Hindu Acharyas and Gurus. It is Hindus like C.P. Ramaswamy Iyer who advocated government control of temples. Intellectual subversion. Media. The media has played no less a destructive role. Please understand the money for media. How many times has the Sangha Parivar bemoaned the fact that we are unable to bring out a national newspaper which will give the leading English dailies a run for their money because we think we do not have the resources. Then think of the kind of money that is going into the Hindu, the Times of India, NDTV, CNN, and IBN. Please understand, this is money that is coming from outside. When these channels function, they do not have national interest in mind. They do not care about national interest. They have to answer to the hands that is pumping money into their channels and papers. Is it any wonder that they are anti-Hindu? A very subtle, a very, very subtle intellectual subversive activity is taking place and I'm afraid there is a large section of even intelligent Hindus who have bought into this argument that we need to partner the US and the developed Western nations to fight Islam, not realizing that jihadi Islam was first pacified and used by the Western nations in Afghanistan and in Kashmir. The West has pacified and used Islam to serve Western colonial interests in non-white, non-Christian nations. If we understand this clearly, we will not make the mistake of thinking that we have to partner Western nations in our war against Jihad. Also understand that the Western nations are the most bitter critics of Hindu nationalism. You only have to read the annual reports which the US State Department churns out on religious freedom, human rights and patterns of global terrorism. The language it uses against the RSS. The language it uses against Hindu nationalism. Why did the US refuse visa to Narendra Modi? It was to send a strong signal to NRIs and would-be NRIs in India that if you want accommodation in the US, you have to distance yourself from Hindutva and Hindu nationalism. No meaningful partnership or cooperation is possible with communism, Islam or Christianity. We must allow them to wage their cosmic wars and if they are warring with each other, sit back, enjoy the fun. Don't think you are going to participate with one of them. None of the three is going to accept Hindu nationalists, Hindu nationalism, Sanatana Dharma or the Dharmi as their equal partners. If anything, they will try to use the gullible sections of the intellectual elite to serve their purpose. The last segment which practices intellectual subversion. I particularly hold a very significant section of the IIT pass outs who have relocated in the United States for this intellectual subversion. When I did some research on anti-Hindu non-government organizations, I found that most of these non-government organizations like AID, ASHA, Akhila Raman, Angana Chatterjee and the others are all well entrenched in American universities. These are communists who are functioning from American universities, who openly write in support of Naxalism, who have participated in the CPI ML Congress. Mahashweta Devi, Arundhati Roy, Praful Bitwa, you name them, they have links with Naxals and they are all well entrenched either in American universities or encouraged by Indians, Indian communists from American universities. And a very large section, significant number are IITNs. Raju Rajagopal is an IIT. Ram Puniyani is IIT. 
Sandeep Pandey is IIT. Balaji Sampath is IIT. There is a significant IIT component, the intellectual elite moving into intellectual subversion. What is the remedy? I'm afraid this is going to stick in the craw of most of us who think tolerance is our defining virtue. I'm afraid Hindu society forgot the valor of the Hindu Rajas, Samrajas and Hindu society which staved off Islamic rule, which fought the colonialists, which is even today fighting the communists at the level of the society. Hindu intellectual elite has a self-imposed image of tolerance which is not real. We have forgotten the Kshatriya blood which is intrinsic to both our intellectual activity and to our public life. There is no Kshatriya blood in the leadership, Hindu leadership today. There is no Kshatriya blood. Sabarimala happened. Pooja Kanchi Acharya episode happened. There is an EVR statue right in front of the Sri Rangam temple. What is the response of Hindu organizations, the Hindu intellectuals and Hindu society? Has there been a response? Has there been an intellectual response? Has there been a physical response? There are very, very highly respected voices from amongst the Hindu community which is actually saying we have no objection to the EVR statue anywhere in Sri Rangam, just not in front of the temple. We have forgotten the concept of temple town. The whole town is a temple. One of Vigil's members, when I said Hindu Rashtra, I mentioned territory. The territory also comprises the character and content of public spaces. Let me tell you the politics of public spaces and the intellectual subversion associated with it. In 1900, the Pope came to India two days before Deepavali, I think in 1999. And he declared his intention of planting the cross in Asia in the third millennium. The first victim of the church planting mission in Asia is South Korea. In 1900, South Korea was less than 1% Christian. In the 1970s, it was around 18.5% Christian. In 1990, it is 40% Christian. Just as what is happening to Kerala. I think in Kerala, according to somebody with whom I traveled by train, slightly over 50% is Hindus. The rest is all gone. Seoul city, from the heart of Seoul city to Seoul airport, is a 20 kilometer stretch. On either side of this 20 kilometer stretch, at every three feet, there is a towering church at every three feet. And these are not the small prayer, Christian prayer houses with the asbestos sheet or attached roof. These are towering churches in the heart of Seoul to the Seoul airport. Scores of churches completely disproportionate to the Christian population or the numbers of those who come to congregate in these churches. Then why are they standing there? Public spaces. The churches are standing there as a symbol of subjugation as a symbol of dominance, as a symbol of money power that I will occupy your public space. The presence of E.V. Ramasamy Naikar, I am 100% sure it is Christian money which has gone into the Dravida Kalgam which has instigated them to plant EVR statue in front of the Rajagopuram. The land was allotted to them in 72. From 72 till this date, they did not dare to plant the statue there. There was continuous Hindu resistance. All of a sudden, how did they get the courage or the money to go and plant it? 
They did it in 2007. Soon after the Kanchi Acharya issue. Soon after the Sabarimala issue. Soon after we showed them, you can keep on rubbing our noses in the dirt. The Hindu community is incapable of any kind of Kshatriya response. Towering churches in Seoul. You enter the Tambram railway station by train. There is this huge cement pillar. On this huge cement pillar, there is a huge Jesus Christ standing like this. When you enter from a train, this is the first thing that you see. Yesterday I was horrified when I came to the Madras Central Station. I think this must have come up about a month ago. I'm entering the Madras Central Station, right beneath the bridge, a huge cement pillar, a huge Jesus Christ, outside the Central Station, standing like this. Occupation of public spaces. This is a political intent. This is not a religious intent. I am dominating you. I am subjugating you. Do we have the sense to see this? I am told that the EVR statue in front of the Sri Rangam temple is not the only perversion. I believe on the Tiruvanandapuram beach there is a Devi temple. And right in front of the Devi temple there is a 50 foot sculpture of a naked woman. Not far from the temple, there is also a church and a mosque. But this naked woman is standing not in front of the church or the mosque, but only in front of the temple. So when the communists speak of atheism, when the Dravidians speak of atheism, they don't speak of anti-Muslim God or anti-Christian God. It is only anti-Hindu. I disagree with Udayan Nambudriji when he talks about Islam. Islam is a threat which you see as a sword against which we still do not have weapons. Christianity is cancer. It invades your body with sweet words. It tells you, I am a part of you and then eats you away. Communism, of course, is a, is a blight on humanity. I cannot have partnership with any of the three. And all the three inside India have intellectual backing. If Arundhati Roy can write a book for Avzal Guru, if Nirmala Deshpande and Mahashweta Devi, they are all, they have all been awarded the Padma Vibhushan by the Congress government. They participate in an Axelite Congress. If Christian conversion can be legitimized by India's academia, the subversion of Indian nation, the Hindu Rajya and the Hindu Rashtra is backed only by intellectual subversion. If they are terrorists, blame us. We are happy victims of terrorism. What stops us from becoming Kshatriyas? What stops us from writing good books? What stops us from producing monographs which will threaten them? What stops us from physically removing these Jesus Christ statues and the EVR statue? Ask yourself that question and you will understand why intellectual subversion has worked in this country. The victims of intellectual subversion, unfortunately, is the Hindu Raji and the Hindu Rashtra, and only Hindus have themselves to blame. Namaskar.